my name is Nicole Kraft, and I am the um, director of the Sports and Society Initiative, which, if you've not heard of us, I'm excited that you're here now so I can introduce what we do to you. And, and what we do is we bring sport and society together by allowing um, this kind of dialogue uh, at the intersection of where sport and society meet each other. Um, we host events normally live uh, throughout the year where we bring together experts um, from a variety of fields from media to medicine to um, athletes to people who work in um, administration for teams. We have people who serve on our board who serve in a variety of pathways in sports. Um, our big goals are to help people better understand the intersection of sport and society and also to uh, facilitate students who may want to have careers in sports but are not um, going to do that from the athletic sense to be able to open up pathways for them. So we provide education, we provide networking, we provide um, different, a variety of opportunities. And, and part of that yeah. is to meet people who are incredibly accomplished at what they do. And that's why we are so excited to welcome Clark to join us here today. Um, I'm, we've been talking a little bit before you got here, Clark, about uh, some other speakers that we'd like to see welcome. And at the end of this, I'm gonna let you guys know about some upcoming events we have. Every Thursday, we're gonna do this, where we're gonna bring somebody on board and talk with them about um, topics that we find interesting. Uh, we have some uh, really great people coming and we have some videos available of ones that we've already done. So uh, we'll make sure that you know about all of that when we get to the end. But I wanna get us started with some of our uh, just terrific questions that we have here. And so, Clark, um, I have to ask, what have you been doing since there's no sports or there's very little sports? Well, you know, right now, Nicole, because college basketball in a normal world would have ended on April 7th at, well, April 6th, when we would have crowned a champion for 2020, I would be in the midst of my second week of sabbatical after a very intense five week period through March and through that first week of April where we crown the champion. There are some long, exhilarating, fun days as part of, part of CBS's broadcast team in the studio. Um, but I would now be in rest, recovery, sabbatical mode here at home, most likely. Um, don't typically go anywhere, although we did have a cruise, my wife and I with another couple planned, actually through the Ohio State Alumni Association tours office. We were headed to the Mediterranean at the end of the month until COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic um, upended that. So I'm home getting some extra yard work in, catching up on some reading, um, doing some um, puzzling. My <laughs> wife and I have started to knock out jigsaw puzzles, something that um, we both enjoyed. So we've been doing a little bit of that and enjoying our kids from, um, from a distance. Thanks to, to FaceTime and Zoom, we've been able to stay connected to our three adult children and our three grandchildren. Can you kind of walk us through what the experience was like for you? You know, we all had this moment when we found out that, that sports for all intents and purposes were canceled. Um, and you must have been just getting ready to hit the, the peak of your season. So walk us through kind of what happened for you. Well, I tell you what, it was interesting because my actual, my last assignment for CBS was March 8th. It was the Michigan State, Ohio State at Michigan State game. I actually was in East Lansing to call that game, senior day for the Spartans. A good win for them, a tough loss for the Buckeyes. And at that point in time, on Monday, that, that well, the ninth, we were scheduled to have our annual CBS Turner get-together in New York. But obviously, because of the gatherings being reduced to less than 40 or 50 people, we did it by phone, a couple of hundred folks on phone on Monday. And at that time, we were still planning to cover the tournament. We were getting ready to um, bring Selection Sunday to the masses on March 15th, uh, we, had a com we had a conference call on Monday the 9th. We had another one with the media on Monday the 10th. It was myself, Charles Barkley, uh, Candace Parker, talking to various writers and media reporters from around the country, again, by conference call. And it was at that time that I got word during this conference call that the Ivy League had canceled its basketball tournament, the men's and women's basketball tournament. It was in, I mean, it was live. Right came right. I had no idea because I was on the call. I wasn't plugged into any social media. And one of the reporters said, hey, what do you think about this? And I was floored. And then the following day, Wednesday, we had the real um, earthquake when Rudy Gobert tested positive for the virus, a Utah Jazz player. And the NBA immediately shut down its season. And from there, 
things really started to cascade in a monumental fashion in terms of the sports world being rocked in Thursday morning. The Big Ten tournament is canceled, and then it just snowballed and snowballed. And at that point, Nicole, um, I pretty much knew that um, we weren't going to be doing the NCAA tournament. And later that afternoon, Thursday, um, that afternoon, Thursday afternoon, it became official when the NCAA announced that the tournament would be um, canceled. What was the feeling that you were getting around basketball circles? I remember, you know, here we had in Columbus, the Arnold Classic was canceled. Yeah, uh, right. And I remember thinking, this, this is, I mean, this is an overreaction or, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And then it just, it didn't even snowball. It was an avalanche that came. What, what were people saying at the time that the cancellation happened? I think people were all over the place, Nicole, as was I. I mean, initially I thought maybe this is a bit of an overreaction. This might be a reach, but I tend to try to evaluate things as they unfold and not overreact or underreact. And yet as things started to continue to surface in the news, and as you started to listen to some of the medical experts, it became real. It became real and it became scary and serious. And you knew the best course of action would be to start following the protocols being instituted by um, our medical professionals and public health experts as they continued. And uh, Governor Mike DeWine, obviously, with the fact that the Arnold brought so many people from so many countries and different places to our city, I think that gave Ohio an opportunity to step forward. And thank goodness Governor DeWine and his staff did so. But I think that, that kind of an event, when talking to the health experts, led them to recognize that if we're going to get a handle on trying to mitigate the spread of this virus, we can't have an event where thousands, tens of thousands of people are going to gather in a number of those folks are coming from all over the world. So uh, I'm grateful that we stepped in as we did initially. I was wondering if that was an overreach and then it felt filtered into the um, tournament sites that were going to host the men's tournament in Dayton and also up in Cleveland. Um, but we're headed, um, it had to be done. But I was, um, you know, it took a while for the void to hit. You know, when it started to happen and then we got the final official call late Thursday afternoon about the tournament being canceled. It really didn't hit me hard until Selection Sunday that day when I started thinking about all the people that I would normally be with, the excitement around being together and bringing to the public the field of 68, the excitement for those student athletes. Many were going to have a chance to participate in the tournament for the first time. And so all of that started to really stir my heart and sadden me quite a bit on, on Sunday. Absolutely. You know, you know this better than anyone, the, you know, the importance of um, this tournament to showcase young players and, you know, players that come up that don't get attention in other, in, throughout the season, maybe they didn't get the attention, but the tournament will bring them to light. You know, it, it can shape the course of, of people's college careers, moving into professional careers. What is going to be the effect, do you think, on this group of athletes that their careers were ended so abruptly or that their season ended so abruptly? Wow, that's a great question. And quite honestly, I have no idea. That experience in this type of um, event obviously will be memorable. And I think you'll have a number of different reactions, a great sense of loss and mourning on the one hand, a sense of incompletion in regards to seniors' athletic careers, uh, a wondering of what could have been. You think about a team like Dayton, perhaps its best season in school history one of its best seasons in school history. Rutgers, a team that hadn't been in the tournament in two decades, was perhaps going to make it. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I imagine it'll be a mixture of feelings and emotions. And for some that have graduated and finished their collegiate careers and their studies, they'll be excited about moving on and getting started with the next chapter of their lives, even though this piece will leave a little bit of a gap. So I think it'll be pretty much all over the spectrum in terms of uh, how young folks will, will navigate such a um, unique and abrupt end to their um, collegiate athletic careers. When you look at someone like uh, Caleb Wesson, who, you know, may have really, I mean, he obviously had a, a strong season, but would have showcased himself differently in the tournament. What does that do to his draft stock? Well, again, it's going to be interesting because of how limited in-person workouts and contacts are for those 
who are interested in pursuing an MBA career before being done with college. Um, I'm not sure in terms of how that affects where Caleb ends up, assuming he keeps his name in the draft. Uh, for a guy like him who is probably looking at being an early second round pick to mid second round pick right now, he doesn't have the opportunity to work himself into perhaps being a first round pick. That can happen during these pre-draft workouts. It's been chronicled with a number of players over the last 15 years or so. The pre-draft workouts can oftentimes um, give you a chance to move yourself up in the eyes of those that'll be drafting you. So he won't, along with the other guys, won't have that opportunity. So it makes it a little less certain and maybe a tad more questionable and risky as to where you might land without that opportunity to um, participate in, in a pre-draft workout. Absolutely. Looking at it from the other side, you know, high school athletes now, of course, had their, I mean, their basketball season was completed, but, you know, there's a lot of time and growth that goes into people, uh, you know, moving forward into their collegiate careers, especially as freshmen. And, and I want to get to the kind of movement we're seeing among freshmen, but how will it affect somebody coming out of high school who's going to miss this time uh, to prepare for what would have been their college um, evolution? Yeah, that's a great, you know, I think it'll certainly hamper it a little bit. Um, there's something about being able to get with your college strength and conditioning coach, your new teammates, and to try to get acclimated during this time between transitioning from leaving high school to becoming a college freshman. I think certainly something will be lost. At the same time, you have to try to be as creative as you can to stay in good shape for your respective sport. And I do think there's some benefit, Nicole, to maybe enjoying some downtime. You know, athletes now are pretty much year round and most athletes are sports specific where you don't have the cross training and you tend to have overuse injuries a lot because of the all year long cycle of most sports. So in some ways, this could be beneficial, even for those that are just stepping into the college ranks. It might be helpful to rest mind, body, and soul a bit as you prepare to take the next step. So I think it'll work um, both ways. Um, and I hope it'll be more positive than negative for those um, first year um, athletes. So how do you think Ohio State would have done in the tournament? What's your prediction? I like the way they were playing. I think the Buckeyes had won nine of the last 11 games they had played. Um, they were feeling good about what they were accomplishing. Roles had been established. I think the coaching staff was comfortable with rotations and so forth. I think they would, be a, they would have been a really dangerous team. I was anticipating they might be a 5, 6 seed, maybe a 4 if they were to win the Big Ten tournament. But somewhere in that 5, 6 seed range um, looked to be realistic. And from that place, based on the teams they had beaten earlier and how they were playing late in the season, I think they could have been really dangerous, along with a number of other teams that had kind of started fast, hit a bit of a skid during conference play, and then were playing good basketball as the season ended. I think of Wisconsin in the Big Ten, and Michigan was starting to find itself a little bit at the end of the season as well, as was Illinois. So there were a number of teams in the Big Ten, like Ohio State, that I thought could be um, pretty dangerous come tournament time. Well, Richard wants to know who you think would have won the tournament this year? Well, you know, I was looking at four teams. I was, you know, obviously we have to have a final four pick when we're on the air. So I like Gonzaga an awful lot. I like that team size and overall talent and balance. Um, I really like the Florida State team down in Tallahassee. Um, tremendous athleticism, size, depth, a nice blend of youth and experience. Um, Kansas was going to be hard to beat, I think. Uh, Baylor had played really well early, was stumbling late, but with the guards they had could have been a real factor. If I was going to be forced to pick just one team without looking at any bracket, assuming everybody was healthy, I would have probably casted my lot with Gonzaga. Okay. Well, Kurt's asking what changes you think might happen in the AAU structure and the impact on college basketball after the recruiting allegations of recent years. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I watched a documentary that kind of revisited that whole FBI investigation fallout. And right now, Nicole, I'm not sure if there's going to be the earthquakes we thought 
in terms of programs being penalized and things being cleaned up. And in some ways that is unfortunate if a lot of what was gathered in the investigation was true. We know there's been an underbelly and seedy side to the recruiting of men's basketball players for a lot of reasons. Um, you can't justify it or rationalize it away when you're breaking rules and compromising the eligibility of young men. But there's also the business component of sports and basketball drives a lot of the NCAA's revenue budget and the coaching salaries are out of whack compared to the great value of a college scholarship. I do think there's tremendous value in that. Um, so I'm not sure where the landscape goes from here. I do know there's more, there's room for greater benefits for all student athletes in terms of what the scholarship includes. And the NCAA, unlike what most people want to believe, has really taken some really good steps to try to enhance the benefit package of a scholarship for student athletes. There's room to enhance that. And my hope is that that would be the case, that uh, more of the revenue that's generated would be um, included in the package for student athletes in terms of their total well-being and benefit. I'm not a big proponent of just flat out crazy stipends, but I am a proponent of cost of attendance plus a little bonus being part of a full scholarship so that student athletes don't have to um, come out of their pocket for anything expense related while they're in college. And I do like to, I would like to see the whole um, emphasis and valuing of education return to the place that it deserves because the vast majority of college athletes are not gonna earn a living playing pro sport. That's factual, that's the reality, but all of the attention that generates the revenue and gets the exposure are the sports that are also popular experience and education. And I hate that sometimes it appears that the business side of it gets so much attention that we lose sight of the hundreds of thousands of athletes that have had their lives changed and the lives of future generations behind them change of being able to earn a scholarship for an education through um, God-given athletic ability and a lot of hard work. Well, I think we're, we're talking to one of them, one person who was able to do that, and we have several questions about your career. Um, one, we'll start back earlier in the beginning about what was your experience as a high school senior in 1979 versus Columbus East in that final game? Oh, man, that must be a tiger that reached in with that car. <laughs> somebody that, hey, it was a great experience other than the fact we came up short. Uh, it was the first time my high school, which had a pretty good athletic tradition and continues to have one, Villa Angela, St. Joe now. But back then it was all boys and St. Joseph High School. and That was the first time our basketball program had gotten to the state finals and had a chance to win it. And um, I loved the experience. My senior year was special on a lot of levels. Uh, we had success as a team. Um, I was highly touted as an individual. Uh, and getting to the state championship in Columbus was a bit of a coronation on a really outstanding career for me. And so I relished the opportunity to come down and play and compete and um, still in pain by the fact that we came up short, Nicole. We uh, just weren't good enough that day to beat Columbus East. <laughs> Uh, but I left my mark on our school in a positive way and uh, scoring enough for us to win it. How do you compare kind of your collegiate experience with what you're seeing today? Um, you know, there, it, it's been such an, an evolution of the game and of the sport. What, what were some of the, the, the real, uh, just the, the biggest areas that you've seen change between the time that you played and now? Well, man, there are a number of things. One, most athletes now are on campus year-round. They might get a break to head home for a week or two or three, and I think that cuts both ways. I enjoyed having my summers available to work, to head home to Cleveland if I so chose to work out on my own and then to come back and get reacclimated to my teammates. But to have that time away was productive and positive for me. I kind of regret that kids are so – um, tied down to being on campus for the full school year. I think there's um, 
there's pros and cons to that. I think the, um, again, I mentioned it earlier, but I think the year round nature of the sports and preparation and training is certainly different than what it was. I think the advancements in how athletes prepare their bodies and minds for competition is so much better now in terms of strengthening your core and how you move the, the, the mechanics of movement in all sports. That's so much better in helping athletes optimize their uh, ability. Um, I think those are probably the biggest things. In the game of basketball, the biggest change in evolution is really the three-point shot. I mean, I don't think there's any question about that. And the overall athleticism of the players. I mean, I was kind of a unique guy when I came out of high school in 60, in 79. I was 6'8", and I could really handle the ball well. Now you've got seven-footers that dribble and play like guards. So that evolution has been significant. The training advancements significant the quality of the facilities and the understanding of how to prepare and then I think too again the year-round nature which um, I'm not a huge huge fan of I'd much rather see kids have time off more so than a week here a week there so they could maybe take advantage of some some work and personal development opportunities away from their sport and their school how do you make the leap to become, you know, such a presence in broadcasting? I mean, so many, there's many great athletes. There's many people who may have the desire, even somewhat the talent, but you were able to put this incredible package together and become, you know, so accomplished in, in so many areas and broadcasting is just seems like the latest one. So um, what's, what's the secret to being a, a great broadcaster from being an athlete? You know, I don't know if there is a secret. I had tremendous help along the way, going back to my parents and the upbringing I had. It wasn't perfect, but it was loving. It was consistent. It was constantly present. I had an extended family near me throughout my days growing up in Cleveland. Uh, all four grandparents around, and aunts and uncles, cousins, coaches, teachers. Um, I was always pretty self-motivated, Nicole. I wanted to excel and wanted to do well. I'm the oldest of five. And um, from some of the psychology birth order books I've read, sometimes those firstborns have a little bit more of a fire to do well than others. So that certainly was something that was part of it. Um, again, I credit a lot of folks who came alongside me to help me grow. But I just have always been a student of whatever I'm doing, whether it was playing and when I wasn't able to play anymore because of knee injury and had to retire once I got into being behind the microphone. I wanted to do it well, and I thought I could do it well. I love words. I love English. I love reading. I love communicating. And I knew basketball. I mean, when you get to the NBA level, you get your PhD in basketball. <laughs> okay. I mean, if you're, paying, if, yeah, yeah, if you're paying any attention at all, I mean, you're going to get an education in basketball that's the best you can get. I mean, that's the highest level you can get to, and the players you interact with, the coaches you play for and compete against all of that stuff helps you see and learn the game and so when I got a chance to stay in the game as a broadcaster with the Pacers on radio um, I took I, I took it to heart I mean I went after it to try to see how how good I could become and now over 30 years later I've continued to to have a place in the game that's given me uh, more than I can probably ever give it. We talked to Kirk Herbstreit last week, um, and you know he had some pretty um, significant challenges with covering the Buckeyes, and <laughs> he was pretty honest about the, what that felt like to him. What yeah. does it feel like to you? What, what's the what's it been like? And have you had any similar struggles? And and do you at all struggle when you yeah. cover the Buckeyes? You know, early on I did because I was so desiring to be objective that maybe I tended to go a little bit on the side of being overcritical or not as balanced, but you have to learn to grow into that. I mean, it would be similar, I think, to coaching your kid. I never did that officially. I've always coached our three children in terms of attitude and effort and fundamentals, but I never actually coached their teams. But I think it would be the same for anybody who's coached their child. There's a desire to be fair and objective, but Sometimes because of the close proximity or the relationship, you tend to skew one way or the other. And so I certainly felt that early on. And football and basketball are totally different animals, as most Buckeye 
fans would know. I mean, there's a whole nother <laughs> level of fandom and rabid following and fanaticism around football than there is basketball. So clearly I feel Kirk's pain in regards to how the Buckeye Nation can be a little bit myopic and only able to see and hear what they want to see and hear from commentators. So uh, I empathize and sympathize in, with them in that regard. But for me in basketball, it wasn't quite the same. And there's just another level of intensity and following with football and passion around it that I think led to some of the uh, unfair challenges I think that Kurt encountered because he's platinum level at what he does. I mean, there's no denying that. And he has been for a very long time. He's one of the very best to do it. And so, uh, yeah, but no, my, my experience, um, not nearly uh, as challenging uh, as his in that regard. Which is also interesting, given your work with the Alumni Association and being on the board of trustees, what made you kind of want to take that next level of engagement with the university? Well, I'm indebted forever to the university for what it's provided me with in terms of education, opportunity, relationships. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to be part of the family of the Ohio State University alumni base. And, you know, to me, whenever you have opportunity to serve, that's part of what God puts us on the earth for, to reflect who he is. And we do that by, um, by loving him and serving other people. And you want to serve those that you have affinity for and that are doing good things and that you're part of. So it was a no brainer and a natural transition for me, as it is for many um, alums and uh, Buckeyes and even folks that aren't alums um, recognize what value and benefit Ohio State has for so many and the great work and the great people that are there. So you want to be a part of that. Um, and I had even more motivation because of being an alum, but uh, my heartbeat is to try to be helpful and to serve and to use what God has given me to hopefully uplift others, my family and those that I have a chance to touch. And sports gives us a unique platform. Uh, those of us that have played whatever level, sports is a tremendous educator. It's a uh, great connector. And it's also a uh, really esteemed platform in our culture. And not just here domestically, I mean, around the world, sports, like music, is a language that most everybody can um, connect to. You know, it's funny that, that you say that. It's a great segue. I was just actually on an interview with The Athletic, and they were asking me about, you know, the effect of not having sports in our lives and, and what it means. And, and we talked about, you know, in so many times of crisis or challenge, sports is where we've turned to feel better and, and to feel yeah. one with the community. What do you think it means that, that in, in – the midst of this crisis that we're lacking sport as that kind of common unifier? Well, there's no question it's a great galvanizer and a connector sports is, but you know what, Nicole, I've thought about it from the standpoint that we have some, we don't have something that we value that brings us together. Now let's be creative in how we replicate that kind of collaboration, that kind of caring, that type of um, breaking down barriers by, really looking after one another and serving each other and doing what we can to help the greater good. I mean, I think those are still human qualities that we have. Sports kind of brings them together, but there's no reason that we can't continue to be um, considerate of others and make changes that are going to be for our own personal good and growth, but also for the good and growth of our um, communities uh, to demonstrate our humanity in ways that are meaningful and lasting. Um, there are significant inequalities that exist, challenges that we have as a nation around race, religion, ethnic, ethnicity, um, gender. Um, so this trying time that everybody is experiencing and adjusting to and dealing with is um, a great challenge. I mean, there's major hardship. It's sobering to read and to talk to and to see uh, the struggles that people are encountering, the loss of life. Um, um, what's going to happen as we work ourselves out of this. But there's also great opportunity for us to uh, come together, to lean on each other, to be the best versions of ourselves. And uh, if sports being taken away will help create that in a meaningful, lasting way, I don't like not having sports, but I'd make that trade off anytime. 
temporarily now. I wouldn't want it to, to, to last forever. I need to get back to work, but, but a temporary hiatus, if it leads to, to growth and improvement in our humanity and, and um, working together and changing some of the imbalances and inequalities and just injustices in our infrastructure and how we go about business with and for one another, then uh, I would think most of us would want to look back and hope that would be the case. And we'd, we'd be glad that we've gone through it. I hope that's where we end up as we um, work our way through this. I couldn't agree more. Um, so what, what is your thought about how we might come out of this? I mean, I, we have quite a few questions about what normal will look like when we kind of get back to whatever that is. Well, there will be consistent. I mean, I think one of the best analogies is what happened after 9-11. I mean, there used to be a time for those who travel and have been in airports over the last 20 years or so. And there was a time when families could actually walk to the gate right. to meet or, or, um, or send off. Um, friends or family. That doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, you can't even go through the security if you don't have a ticket. So those types of things that are commonplace now in the norm will be similar in terms of hand washing, sanitizers, physical distancing. So I don't know exactly how it's going to play out. I do know it will be different and some of the different, some of the difference will be lasting. Uh, I think most of the difference will be good. Some of it will be inconvenient and uncomfortable. But um, I haven't given myself a lot of time to think about exactly what it might look like. I've tended to think more in, in the bigger picture. I, am I, will I be better and different in, in a meaningful way, way? Will we be better and different as a people? Will our, will our, will our structures and systems around health care and taking care of those in need and um, the underemployed and so forth, will we be better? in those places and um, if we're not that would be um, a terrible waste of a um, of a very difficult crisis absolutely well we have a, a couple people mentioning that you must miss being able to work with charles barkley at this point <laughs> and they're asking oh, yeah, that... <laughs> what that's like and uh i don't know if it segues uh but who is your most enjoyable broadcast partner so both what it's like to work with him and who do you like working with the most Hey, Nicole, um, my mom, before she passed, and she's been gone since 1994, unfortunately, but she gave me a plaque not long after I got married, and it listed a number of qualities for having a good marriage. But the last thing, or one of the last sentences in the, uh, in the uh, plaque that she gave me was that it's not about having the right partner. It's about being the right partner. So I love, I certainly have my favorites, mm -hmm. but I love everybody I work with and I appreciate what they bring to the table. And I'm more inclined to think about how am I being a good partner to serve whoever I work with. Charles is work, working with Charles is just like it appears to be. It's <laughs> funny. It's funny. It's unpredictable. It's real. You know, he's just such a gracious, genuine guy. And he's a naturally funny guy. I mean, some people early on thought he was putting on a stick when he was on, when he went to television, but he's always been quick witted and funny and um, great with people, gracious with his time, realistic about who he is and what he's about. No pretension, um, nothing fake about him. And I love being around him. I only get to be around him three, three and a half weeks during the tournament, but it's a fun, fun ride. He and Kenny and Ernie are really close as um, colleagues on the air at Turner with that show they do but I love working with Charles and Ken because both of them know basketball and both of them have had I mean Charles is a hall of famer and Kenny's a two-time NBA champion and they bring that unique level of accomplishment and experience um, to the broadcast booth and then Ernie is the consummate pro as is Greg Gumbel. Seth Davis and I have become really close um, he's actually a writer does some writing for the athletic and uh, so forth and has been great on the air um, I've had countless over the years when I was at ESPN, um, Bob Carpenter, Dan Patrick, Tarico, Chris Fowler. I mean, I've worked with John, the late John Saunders, and I enjoyed, believe me, I enjoyed all of them. Kevin Harlan's one of my favorite play-by-play -play partners to work with. Spiro Ditas, who I worked with, um, probably six of the eight games I did this year for CBS, is a really good young broadcaster and great guy. So I've been fortunate. I mean, I, I've, I could go down the list uh, with the partners I've had, all of them have have um, enhanced uh, my growth and development and have been really great to, to work with. But Charles is unique now. He's, um, <laughs> he, is, he is definitely unique. He's got his own style. 
but uh, I enjoy um, I enjoy being with my I like the workout my laughing muscles get when I'm, <laughs> when, when I'm hanging out with him. Well, we have quite a few questions about uh, something that has been prominently on our minds, which is the transfer portal and the departure of high profile student athletes. And of course, uh, yeah. I had the privilege this year of teaching um, Alonzo Gaffney and I, I taught uh, DJ Carton, um, both of whom are, are mm. course, not with us any longer. Wow. Um, so you know, can you kind of, what is your perspective on the transfer portal, on kind of the desire of young players to be moving the way they are? Yeah, you know, it's a mixed bag. I'm not a huge fan of it. I do enjoy student athletes having options and choices and making decisions because that's part of growing up. Um, but I'm also a little concerned about the tendency, not just in athletics, but across all of society with our younger generations to sometimes think that things are easier elsewhere as opposed to staying the course and working through whatever headwinds or adversity might be in front of them. And that's not the case all the time. I know there are circumstances where it just isn't the right fit. It's not their personal or family reasons. But by and large, when you see the increase and escalation in the number of transfers, and it's been crazy. It's almost been like watching the coronavirus case report. Yeah. You know, in terms of the number and the increase from year to year over the last five years. And oftentimes, it's just for surface reasons. And again, you have that prerogative, but um, I don't like it. I don't like it. I like the freedom of movement. I do like the opportunity. Coaches can bounce. I mean, there are buyouts and contracts now to try to keep that from happening, but um, student athletes should have the right to move. I just wonder and question whether the decisions that are leading to the transfers are the best for that individual at that time and who is actually influencing the kids. A lot of times in this day and age, Nicole, in my experience is that oftentimes parents or people in the inner circle of the family are heavily involved in make or encouraging kids to, to look for greener grass elsewhere when part of growth is that sometimes your grass is a little brown and you have to stay around to see if you can make it green right? as opposed to just running to where you think it might be greener. So um, I don't necessarily like it. I really don't because I don't think a lot of the reasons for the moves are in the best interest of um, the development of the um, of the student athlete. That's just my my personal my personal take on it. What about the Jalen Green scenario now of skipping college altogether and going to the G League? And you know, we now are looking at significant amount of money being put forward to keep high school students moving into that professional pipeline. What effect? Will yeah, that I don't be? have a real problem with that because it's such a small number of players and kids that'll have even that opportunity or ability to skip a step, high school to pro. I mean, before we, before the NBA instituted the um, one year removed from high school and 19 years of age rule back in 2006, I think is when that was collectively bargained because they were really the league wasn't interested in having general managers and presidents in high school gym scouting players. So they instituted that rule. And I think in theory, it made sense. I thought a better one year of college is better than none, but only if the student is really there with both feet in while he's there to take advantage of being in school to develop and grow for so many or some anyway I won't say so many but for some it was a um, it was a hindrance they didn't really want to be in college and therefore it didn't really work out great for them or the program they went to in some ways but I don't have a problem with multiple pathways to a career in pro sports I mean college isn't the only way and it shouldn't be the only way of kids. And quite honestly, kids don't have to go to college if they feel like they're good enough and want to cast their bread on the pro water early. It's not ideal what's available, but it's going to get better with this pathway program now. So I think you'll see some of the elite players coming out of high school elect to choose that route. And I have no problem with that. I don't begrudge them. It's also, I mean, it's an opportunity and some, will be able to make it work. And those who don't will have to suffer the consequence of their choices. That's all, and I don't have a problem with that. It's a small number, 
when you look at the vast number of folks. But we'll see how it plays out. We'll see how it plays out, how it might impact college troops um, down the road if more of the elite players decide that's the option they want to go and how, how might that change college basketball. That's TBD. But, um, no, I'm, I'm all for um, multiple pathways for kids to um, realize dreams, to fulfill potential, and certainly to have an opportunity um, to, to get an education through their athletic ability if they so choose. What do you think uh, the, the, for the future of women's professional basketball? You know, the WNBA draft just took place, and obviously very, very high-profile player coming out there. Where do you think we're going to go there? Yeah, I think the league has done really well. I mean, it's um, 20 years now that the league has been in existence. I think it's about 20 now. Yeah, it's been uh, – is it 20? Yeah, I want to say 96. Sure, it's 20-plus, and um, – I think it's on good footing. I really do, and I'm excited for the league to continue to grow. I think um, sports in general for women with um, Title IX and the opportunities women have to compete and to experience sports and all that it can offer is great. The WNBA, I think, will continue to grow. The NBA has been a huge supporter, and I think the public is beginning to become more, uh, more a fan um, of, the, of the women's game. Um, not comparing it to the guys, but recognizing um, these women are elite athletes and terrific players in their own right and um, deserve support and um, respect and admiration. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the future of, um, of the WNBA going forward. So we have – have you been watching the uh, Michael Jordan documentary? Yeah, we checked it out. Yeah, that's a, kind of a family affair for us. Our, our, our two boys played high school and college hoops and – um, our daughter played volleyball. My wife loves sports. So, yeah, we checked it out. Really enjoyed um, the first two episodes. So we've been asking if you have any favorite MJ memories or stories. And if you had to determine the greatest of all time, would it be MJ or LeBron? <laughs> yeah, a number of MJ stories. I actually competed against Michael. I, I was drafted by the Pacers in 82, and he was drafted by the Bulls in 84. So we were both teams near the bottom of the barrel during that time. So. Um, our, our, our matchups were pretty competitive, and I think we probably split the matchups we had during his first year in the league before I got hurt. Um, but my favorite memory of him really is just – and it's not one moment. It's really how he grew when he started to embrace weight training in the late 80s, early 90s, after he had bumped his head against the Pistons in the playoffs and couldn't quite make it through, and then he took – weightlifting to another level and really became one of the greatest of all time. Uh, it's debatable which way you go on that question. Um, I tend to lean towards uh, LeBron just because he's bigger. Um, LeBron is 6'8 and 250-ish. Jordan was 6'6 six, six and 215, both on your Mount Rushmore, no doubt, whatever other players you would put on that. But if somebody – backed me up against a wall and made me pick one. I know Jordan's got the six finals trophies and finals MVPs, and I don't have a problem for folks who go Jordan, but my personal preference, just picking those two, um, I would lean towards LeBron, and I'm a little biased too. LeBron's a Northeastern Ohio guy, as am I. Uh, but my top guy is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. If somebody made me just pick one, in terms of all-time NBA greats, that's the guy I'm hanging my hat with. I'm with you. I, I worked for the Sixers uh, when Julius was still playing. and uh, Oh, did you? Yeah, so the matchup, being able to see Kareem and Magic and Julius, and that was, uh, Ooh, that was the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they won it. That was 83 when they met my rookie year in the, in the NBA is when they won the title, the Sixers. And, uh, yeah, the, they, they did us in. We competed hard against them, but nobody was dealing with those guys that year with Moses Malone. Andrew, Tony, and man, Maurice they were, uh, yeah, they were Maurice Cheeks, Clint Richardson. Oh, they were terrific. They were absolutely, absolutely terrific. Yeah. So what are your stuff. fellow uh, uh, student athletes, Steve Chapelier, um says uh -huh. you make a practice of carrying a notebook. And of course, Steve is on the board of Sports and Society as well. And he says you yeah. jot down your thoughts and observations. Can you describe how this helps you? Yeah, you know what? I'm a journaler. My mom, my late mom journaled probably – I think she started when I was going through all of my recruiting back in 78, 79, and she journaled until she died. And when she shared some of the stuff she documented with me, 
I thought it would be cool if I started that once I got married and had a family. So in the early 90s, I started journaling and pretty much was consistent until 2000 and then took some time off and uh, life happened and so forth. I got a little lazy. But since 2013, I've been back at it pretty good. And really, it just helps me document and chronicle uh, things that God is doing in my life, what's going on with my family, um, feelings I've had. But most of it is chronicling uh, people I've interacted with, what I've done, what my family has done, highlight moments, those kinds of things. And at some point, I think it might be material for a memoir or a book. Uh, I fashion myself as wanting to be a writer. So at some point, I'm going to take the challenge and, and step into that water. So hopefully that'll be helpful when that time comes. So, But I enjoy just kind of keeping tabs, and it helps you recall things. I mean, mm -hmm. our minds are great. Our, our brains are great organs, but at some point, um, the hard drive gets full or we forget what's on the hard drive. So <laughs> sometimes if you can write it down, you can recapture it. At least I, you go back and look at it. So someone asked, uh, you know, basketball has had such a significant impact on your life and, and intertwined so deeply. What if basketball was not in your life? What, what would you have done? What would have been your career path or your life path, do you think? I really enjoyed business. I was a marketing major at Ohio State. Um, one of my dear friends and mentors is an Ohio State grad, very successful insurance agent, a guy by the name of Ira Novak. So I spent time as a high school junior through my college career working summers in his insurance agency and learning that business. Uh, I've always been fascinated by business, whether it's uh, investing in stocks and bonds or maybe being a financial planner or financial um, services advisor. I thought those were areas that intrigued me and actually even thought about those areas when I was forced to retire from playing um, prematurely back in 1987. Uh, but basketball is what I knew best at the time, and I got the opportunity to go in the broadcasting direction, and, and that was a good fit. But I think I would have been, been engaged in some form of, um, of um, financial services or some type of um, entrepreneurial pursuit. So uh, Richard's looking out here for our students that are on. He says, if a young person would like to get into sports comm, either as a broadcaster, written, or digital media, what advice would you give them to help them move forward in their career? Well, the greatest advice I could offer, I mean, my pathway is a little different than the norm because I was on the court and on the court at the highest level. So that transition to an analyst, um, oftentimes through name recognition and accomplishment on the floor, can open doors. And that's really what happened for me during my time with the Pacers and my relationship with that organization. And in the community, there was a real desire to have me stay connected to the franchise. And that was what we landed on as a way that I could perhaps add some value because of my recent experience on the court with a relatively new play-by-play -play guy back in 1987. And then I got a chance to do Cleveland State University TV that same year because of my connection to Cleveland and name recognition. But I think in most cases, uh, the networking avenue pursued by students in terms of being available to gain whatever experience and interact with whoever you can that's doing what you would like to do. And Ohio State affords great opportunities with an athletic department the size of Ohio State's with the notoriety of the university athletically, uh, the fact that so many networks are here televising, covering um, Ohio State gives you chances. But it's a very demanding, competitive field. But I think the networking component of getting yourself, putting yourself in the path of people and opportunities, even if they don't fit exactly what you want to do, if they're attached to sports communication in some form or fashion, that's the way to uh, try to make your way is uh, to do that and be ready to, um, to add value in whatever role you can scratch out for yourself early on and uh, recognize it's a process. You know, as we're, we're kind of getting near the end here, I, I it just, it's such an important thing. You know, I see so many alums that are on this call right now and, and you're an alum and I'm an alum and, and we have students on here that will soon be alum. And this, 
this thing that Ohio State has that brings us all together and keeps us all together mm -hmm. seems really special to me. I, I, I have other degrees from other universities, but I will always be a Buckeye first and foremost. What is it about Ohio State, do you think, that allows us to build this family and keep it going throughout the, the you know, through time and change that, you know, yeah. my friendship? I really think it's a combination of factors, but most of all, it's the people and the spirit that they bring to the university and the spirit that connects us all, that affinity for the institution. Um, the city is great, obviously. Columbus has continued to grow and be a hidden gem in my mind um, as the people come from different places and are really pleasantly surprised at the vibrancy and the uh, collaboration that exists within the city. Um, but I think the university itself, um, athletics is part of it, uh, a prominent medical center. But I just think it's, it's, um, it's really the people and the way that they connect as Buckeyes. And a lot of the folks that end up in school here, particularly at the undergraduate level, I guess I'm thinking 60% or so are, are, are Ohio folks. I know we've grown in terms of our out-of-state uh, population of students and alums, but a good number of folks are, uh, are Ohio folks, and that, that flagship nature of the university and what it represents statewide, particularly to people from Ohio and even in the Midwest, it resonates, and it has a special uh, sense of pride to it and a special sense of, um, of um, family to it. And, but again, I think it goes back to the people, the, the, the passion that the people have for for this institution and their experiences here, how that's shared and perpetuated um, amongst classmates within families, uh, just makes it special. It's um, it's really it's hard to articulate completely because people come from out of outside of it, and they 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 like, man, you guys are crazy. I mean, <laughs> this, this is this Buckeye Nation stuff, and it's it's real though. I mean, people want, and once folks are here, they and recognize it as something that's, that's special and, and good. And, and, and that to me is part of what, what keeps it going is that it is special and it's good and it's, and it's something that connects all of us who um, have um, scarlet and gray veins running through our body. Absolutely. Well, Clark Kellogg, I cannot tell you what a privilege it has been to be part of this conversation with you. Um, I did want to let everybody know that next week we're going to be bringing in a uh, 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 alum of ours, um, Eric Overman, who is the administrator of the Naismith Award. Oh, my God. Yeah, yes. That's my God. And he's going to talk oh, that's great. about how that's the Naismith great. Awards have changed the, the lives of so many young basketball players and how yeah. that process. He's also a big supporter of our students. Uh, the week yeah. after that, on May 7th, we're going to bring in uh, Jerry Snodgrass from Ohio High School Athletic Association oh, yeah. oh, and Tom yeah. Ferry from the Aspen Institute to talk about the impact of the cancellation of high school spring sports and how that's going to affect our students, our student athletes, and kind of the culture that we have. I um, mean, I also want to give you just a heads up that uh, the first week in June, I think we're looking at June 7th, uh, uh, Colt Coach Chris Holtman and his wife, Lori, will be joining us uh, for a huddle to talk about uh, their involvement in our community, about basketball, about their foundation, about a multitude of topics. So we're gonna keep awesome. having people come every week. I can't say that everything's gonna be as great as talking with you, Clark Kellogg, but we're gonna do our best. And uh, we're so grateful for your time and your insights. And we wish you to, to stay well and healthy. And we hope to see you back on a call really soon. Well, I will be back. Make sure you send me the invite for those upcoming calls. I'd love to join those huddles and be a, um, be a, be a listener and a learner for those. And thank you, Nicole. Appreciate your work, all that you're doing. And um, it was a real pleasure to have a chance to, to hang out with you and the others that um, tuned in. You have a great day. Yep, you do the same. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be compliant.